Hey everyone, Brady from TextureLabs.org here. It's the tutorial request I get more often than any other, hands down, the movie poster, the sci-fi fantasy superhero movie poster. You know the style, and it's a video I've been wanting to make for a long time, but it just seemed a little scary, like a 65-hour YouTube video. But I thought, all right, let's narrow it down, break it into concrete steps, and I was really surprised to find that by sticking to a format and not veering down all the possible paths you can take in Photoshop, it actually made the whole process a lot more fun. So in this video, we're going to break down an approach to this movie poster aesthetic into nine steps. With each one, we're going to look at a pitfall that can throw your project off course, and we're going to establish some constraints, some rules of the game that'll help try to make the whole process a little bit more manageable. Let's get into Photoshop and get started. Step number one, gather your images. So your source images can be from anywhere, whether they're free images, things from stock websites, something you shoot yourself. These are the images I'm using in this project. A few of them are from Adobe Stock. A few of them are from the NASA website. But we've got to look out for pitfall number one, a bad beginning makes a bad ending. So we're going to set our first constraint here, and it's going to be pretty obvious. Use quality images. No matter how much you might want your brother-in-law in a superhero movie poster, if you don't have a great photograph, it's going to be really difficult to make that happen. It is tough finding good assets, but the good news is that I've got you covered on these additional elements, the lens flares, light streaks, color overlays. This is all Texture Lab stuff. It's all free. The most important element we're looking for in source images, good lighting. There's no single rule of thumb of what that looks like, but if you can find images that have this rim lighting effect, you get huge movie poster bonus points. Resolution is also important, but just as a test, I did build out an image using all the same steps we'll cover in this video, but using only preview images from some stock elements. It lacks a little bit of detail, but I was still able to get a pretty nice final result. Okay, so we've got our assets. Let's move on to step number two. We're going to clip out a single item, something to get started with. And sometimes the automated tools work well. Sometimes you got to get in there and cut things out by hand. I like the polygonal lasso tool myself, but no matter what you use, you got to watch out for this pitfall, fringy edges. This may not seem that bad, but even this little white edge is going to come back and haunt us, especially if we start to crank the values on this image or sharpen it up. So the constraint here, take the time to clean up the edges. And there are basically two approaches to dealing with this. I think what people do most of the time is to push the mask inward somehow. But I much prefer to do the opposite, basically push the color information out. So for example, with the RGB channel selected, I could use the clone tool to copy this color information near the edges and just move it outward. Or here's a technique that works in a lot of cases. I'm going to command or control click the mask to select the shape, then unlink the mask and select the color channel. Then I'm going to modify the selection to be a border selection, maybe five pixels wide. And then I'm going to zoom way in here so we can see this. I'm going to use the minimum filter, bring it up to about three. And what that does is push the darker valued pixels outward by three pixels, just enough to fill in that white halo. Okay, so I've got my first element clipped out. I'm going to right click and convert it to a smart object, then copy the smart object and move on to step number three, rough in a background. New document, this is going to be where we put it all together. I'm going to build this out to be 2700 pixels by 4000 pixels. So first of all, I'm going to paste in that clipped out image. And before doing anything to it, I'm just going to try to get a very rough background going. Generally, what I want to do here is get just a few layers in and kind of loosely establish the general color palette and tone. So I'm starting with this galaxy image from NASA, then just a couple of light streaks and this big abstract color field, loosely experimenting with just a couple of elements. But now that I am starting to use multiple layers, I'm looking out for this very dangerous pitfall, too much too soon. And I'd say one of the main contributing factors to too much too soon is the use of dramatic blending modes. As tempting as hard light and add mode and color burn and all the rest might be, too many blending modes can make your image very quickly spiral out of control with harsh contrast and colors that are all over the place. Looking at some of these really complex poster designs, you have to wonder how you can get this many elements in here without the whole thing collapsing like a house of cards. And I think a huge part of it is just restraint. So what I'm going to do is limit myself to this constraint. I'm going to use just two blending modes, normal and screen. And I'm going to try to stick to that rule, not just for the background, but as I get all of the elements in place. There's always room to break that rule when it comes to color correction or for deliberate effects like these lightsabers are probably using add mode. 
But I'm guessing that almost everything else in this image in terms of the actual subject matter, the characters, the smoke, the stars, are all normal blend mode, screen blend mode, or potentially multiply. I am allowing myself to manipulate some of the assets as I bring them in, so stretching things out or using levels or hue saturation to adjust the color, but trying to keep it simple, establish a background so I can move on to step number four, image treatment. This is where we take this clean photographic image and try to give it that cinematic, almost painterly dramatic look. The pitfall we're gonna avoid, I'm gonna call it a little bit of this, a little bit of that. With so many tools at our disposal in Photoshop, do we posterize the image, use oil paint, photo filters, filter gallery? What tends to happen is that you can quickly find yourself lost at sea with a bunch of effects and not a lot of room to maneuver. So the goal is to keep it lean and mean. I'm gonna set myself an ambitious constraint. I'm gonna use only one filter. Here's the catch, it's the camera raw filter, meaning it's like a million different adjustments in one. But Camera Raw forces you to make all these adjustments while thinking about their relationship to each other. Plus, the way Camera Raw processes an image is much less lossy than stacking up similar adjustments. So for example, I could bring an image way down using one setting, then bring it right back up with another, and Camera Raw takes all these factors into account before it processes each pixel. Whereas if I did a similar thing, but with individual adjustments in sequence, I'm losing information with every single step. Additionally, while it seems like just a color correction tool, I think a lot of the power of this filter is in the detail and noise reduction settings, which can treat an image almost the way the oil paint filter does and give it a little bit of that illustrated smoothed out look. So before I even work on the color, I'm really gonna push around these noise reduction and sharpening settings and get pretty heavy handed with them. I'm bringing the noise reduction here all the way up and also doing a ton of sharpening at the same time. Then I'm gonna work on the color and on the exposure, all the standard color correction stuff. There really is no one size fits all solution for color correction. It all depends on what your starting point is and what you're going for. My best advice, get to know all the settings in Camera Raw Filter and also have a reference image to look at as you dial things in. I will point out one obscure setting that I almost always end up using. Way down here at the bottom under calibration, the green primary hue, I'll oftentimes push this all the way to the top. What does that do? It kind of neutralizes the yellows and greens that tend to show up in skin tones and give them a little bit more of that monochromatic bronze look. Now the downside to Camera Raw Filter is that you can't preview the background while you work on it. But since this is a smart object, you can always go back and revisit these settings, especially as we get other elements in the scene in step number five, a few more images. This is where we start to populate the scene, not with any atmosphere or lens flares or anything, just bringing in subject matter, whether they're background elements or foreground elements. I'm giving each layer an initial treatment using Camera Raw Filter and then moving everything around and just trying to find a decent composition. The pitfall here, I don't know what goes where. I have 47 layers and this is a mess. Okay, here's the deal. Most of the time, especially if you're working with no sketch and just pushing around elements from all over the place, most of the time, almost everything looks like shit. That's okay, that's the process. It's really tricky finding a nice composition where everything works, it kind of tells the story you wanna tell, things feel like they're sitting in the right place. The best we can do is try to practice this constraint, don't get attached. If it's really not working, delete the layer. Your biggest challenge is that you're gonna end up with so many elements, so many layers, you'll just feel paralyzed. See if you could find a logic to your composition. Is everything centered? Does everything form a triangle, a diamond? Maybe there's a purposeful asymmetry. There's a lot of revisiting the camera raw filter on individual elements, trying to get them to feel like they're in the same universe. Of course, you're probably gonna need to mask some things out. Maybe Photoshop in some extra information where you don't have it. And of course, there's gonna be some improvisation. So here, I'm just missing so much information. I'm just gonna fade everything out to black using one big gradient. Meaning I'm gonna have to break my rule of not using any special blending modes. Linear burn just makes a much more dramatic fade to black. So is what it is. Okay, once you have a general composition and you wanna see if you can glue it together, move on to step number six, create depth between the layers. So a little bit of outer glow effect is kind of a freebie. You can count on just about every movie poster to use some kind of a glow effect to separate elements. But with the outer glow effect, just be sure that layer mask hides effects is turned on so you're not making the mask glow too. 
However, the primary thing we're going to do in this step is insert some more layers in between the hero elements. They can be lens flares or smoke elements, glows, gradients. We're basically creating a little sandwich in front of and behind each piece of subject matter. The pitfall? This is getting complicated. The constraint? Make a choice about a specific element you're going to use to separate the layers. Check out the Star Wars poster, beautiful sense of depth, and it's all about this blue smoke in between the layers. Thor poster, all about these light streaks separating the characters. So in this project, I'm going to try to accomplish this with just a single element, this lens flare. I'm giving it some Gaussian blur, so it's just a big blurry blob, and I'm sticking to my rule here just using screen mode. And then I'm using it in between these different layers, a lot of copies of the same element, experimenting with the size and the placement, it's still a somewhat manageable amount of layers, so I can scoot things around and just see if I can find some arrangement where the composition works, I've got a nice sense of depth happening, and I'm feeling good about the logic of the image. Once these big blocks are in place, we'll move on to step number seven, a little movie magic. And this is where we start to fill in the gaps with maybe some fog elements, some rain, some detail on the environment. We can take a little streaky lens flare and apply it to anything remotely shiny, still sticking to screen mode for all these elements so nothing goes too crazy. The pitfall somewhere around this point, that creeping feeling like you should go back to step number one. The constraint, Take the time to review your layers occasionally. If you go through them one by one, you may find there's a certain element that kind of sets off your spidey sense and there's just a single thing out of place. Sometimes you're closer than you think and you just need fresh eyes on each layer. So since I'm skipping through time a little bit in this video, let's do a quick layer review of everything here so far. From bottom to top, we've got some stars, the moon, some smoke, some light streaks, and this color field, then this dragon over here in the distance, basically the far background. Then we've got some lens flares to create kind of a field for the next elements. This guy with some rain and lightning. The pyramids over here, so these are kind of the mid-ground elements. Then hero number one with some lens flares and light streaks to separate him from hero number two. The gradient for a fade to black. Then a big lens flare for a little bit more depth. And then these tiny lens flares for the shiny things. Okay, we'll sign off on that and move to step number eight overall color. The goal is just to give the whole thing some light color treatment. All blending mode restrictions have been lifted. So here's a blue solid set to screen with a gradient in the mask, a greenish solid set to overlay with a gradient in the mask. The pitfall at this point, overdoing it, and I get it, nothing like a heavy-handed color treatment to make an image look official, but the constraint, check your reference, pick a tone, keep it simple. So I'm taking some cues from this Thor poster. Pretty awesome colors happening in here. I'm liking this kind of purple and orange palette. Here's a method for toning the shadows and highlights that I feel like does a good job while keeping it subtle. What it is is a gradient map adjustment layer set to soft light mode. And then just messing around with the top and the bottom color here, I think it's a nice way to carve out sort of an overall palette. All right, we're ready to wrap it up with step number nine, finalize the image, where we'll package the whole thing up, add some text in here and make it look official. There's a great font template from Tip Squirrel that I'll link to for this credits block. I honestly can help myself. I've got to screen some papery grunge in here and just make this thing look a little bit vintage. Then always the final step for me, I'm gonna make a merged copy of the whole image, give it just one pixel of Gaussian blur to kind of hide the tracks a little bit, and then run the whole thing through camera raw filter one last time and dial in everything as a whole. Finally giving myself the leeway to crank up the contrast a little bit, maybe use a few of these more dramatic settings in camera raw like texture and dehaze, sharpen it all up a little bit. That's the before and the after. It just gives it a little bit of extra pop. I like to think of this last camera raw filter kind of like shrink wrapping the image. So with that, our movie poster is done. All right, well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and that it has at least made this genre feel a little bit more approachable. The fact is, it's a really tough look to pull off. When we see those killer movie posters, we're seeing the best of the best in compositing and in illustration. I will say that no matter what your skill level, it's a really fun format to work in. It makes a great exercise to sharpen up your skills. If you make something in the style, I'd love to check it out. Tag me at Texture Labs. I'm a little slow on the Instagram turnaround, but I do love to see your work. All right, well, thank you for watching and I will see you next time.